like the other adipose tissue. And what happens in the brown adipose tissue is, you know, you have your electron transport chain that's in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And so this, is, this represents the four complexes and then ATP synthase. And we know that we get a payoff of ATP right there when you have oxidative phosphorylation going on. But whenever you have brown fat, you have a particular protein in the inner membrane called uncoupling protein one. And so what it does is it literally uncouples this potential energy, which is the hydrogen ions, from oxidative phosphorylation. And so it's basically like this feudal cycle. Um, if you remember how we got the hydrogen ions here, here in the first place is through cellular respiration, glycolysis, and the Krebs cycle. We had those high energy electrons that came in as NADHs and FADH2s. And so they just pumped hydrogen ions into the inter intermembrane space. So we had this electrochemical gradient going from the intermembrane space back to the matrix of the mitochondria. And typically it goes through this process and makes ATP. But in brown adipose tissue, we have these channels that will allow these to leak back into the matrix and it just dissipates as heat. So basically, um, it's increasing your metabolism and, and you know, it's, it's basically less efficient, but it's good because um, we're not making ATP, so that makes our ATP levels low. That causes more lipolysis, breakdown of fat, and uh, more uh, glycolysis, the breakdown of sugar to, to get to ATP. So. Uh, this is really good and it is so metabolically active that if you do a PET scan, positron emission tomography, and you use fluorodeoxyglucose, which is radioactive, it'll go right to this brown adipose tissue because it's so metabolically active. It's kind of like a tumor. A tumor is metabolically active. You use PET scans to, to see it light up, and so does our brown adipose tissue. And as adults, we typically only have these uh, above our clavicles, so supraclavicular and then kind of in between our shoulder blades, interscapular. So there's just little areas there. When we're babies, we have a lot. It's kind of dispersed all over. And this makes sense because baby, this is brown adipose tissue is for non-shivering thermogenesis. So when we get cold, this is a way for us to heat up. It gets activated. This system gets activated in the cold. So, if, you know, a baby has a high surface area to volume ratio and they don't have very good muscle yet. So they can't shiver like we can shiver. And uh, because they have that huge surface area, they need more of this non-shivering thermogenesis just in case they're cold to be able to generate heat. And um, we want to hang on to this and get as much of this as possible as we get older because it's, it uh, helps with preventing diabetes because it kind of lowers our blood glucose levels and it helps our metabolism to be um, higher. So what are some things we can do to activate our brown adipose tissue or to cause our white adipose tissue to convert to brown adipose tissue. That's called browning of white fat. And it, it's kind of like a spectrum. It goes from white to beige to brown as it accumulates more mitochondria. So the browning process is really just mitogenesis or the creation of more mitochondria. And then within the brown adipose tissue, it just expresses a lot of this uncoupling protein one. So, uh, does anybody know what can cause browning? Anybody looked into this at all? So one is uh, cold exposure. There's a big push for like cryotherapy and all these different, um, you know, cold immersion, cold baths, that kind of thing. And this is one reason why people do that is to increase the brown adipose tissue. If you were to go and look, measure brown adipose tissue, you know, in the northern and southern latitudes where it's cold, people have more brown adipose tissue just because they're exposed to more cold weather. And it doesn't have to be super cold. Like, I've, has anybody ever done the crowd chamber where you get in and it's like two minutes? Um, I do that sometimes and it's just, you start, I mean, it's just so cold. You're shivering within a half a second and, um, but you feel rejuvenated and everything, but it's basically like a hormesis where you try to like stress the system a little bit, but in a controlled manner that, that helps your gene expression overall. And so uh, you don't have to get extreme cold. A lot of people take ice baths and or cold showers that can help uh, 
create more browning and or white adipose to brown adipose and activation. Because when you're cold, you activate your sympathetic nervous system, and then the, uh, it'll it'll stimulate the beta three adrenergic receptors. Beta three adrenergic receptors aren't too ubiquitous in the body. Does anybody remember where the other place that we see that is? The bladder. Yeah. So mirabegron was a drug that works for overactive bladder, and it works by um, activating the beta three receptors on the detrusor, the smooth muscle of the bladder. But we also have beta-3 receptors on the um, brown adipose tissue as well, and white adipose tissue. So um, cold exposure to one, and there's been studies where they just, maybe someone sleeps at like 64 degrees. So it's not real cold, but it's good to, it's good to be cold when you sleep anyways. Uh, it helps you get into a deeper sleep. So they measured that over like eight weeks, and the people that slept in a room at 64, they had covers and everything too, but just slightly colder, they developed more brown adipose tissue. So it doesn't have to be extreme cold if you don't like really, really cold. Another one is exercise. So exercise basically just helps everything. You know, whatever it is, it always seems like it comes back to exercise being helpful. And so exercise stimulates something called irisin, and irisin causes browning of white fat. It activates brown fat. Um, so you're gonna get more brown fat, you're gonna get more activation of brown fat. When you're exercising, you stimulate, a lot of times your sympathetic nervous system is stimulated. That's gonna you know, activate the brown fat. And so uh, exercise is great. And it's all kinds of exercise, whether it's cardio or, or strength training, it all kind of, is that arson going because it's from contracting muscles. And arson also increases BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. So that's one way exercise can help strengthen your brain as well. Uh, then there's some supplements. And these supplements are, uh, are also something that keep coming up over and over. So I'm pretty tight with my money, but I spend money on these supplements. One is omega-3s. And it's really hard to get enough omega-3s in your diet. So this is one that, you know, I strongly recommend supplementing. I eat salmon two or three times a week and mahi-mahi um, and halibut anytime I get a chance. And I still am low on my omega-3s when I measured it in red blood cells. So um, I take a, a supplement here. So omega-3s, basically they do several things. They increase gene expression of uncoupling protein one, so you get more of these placed in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, they also cause browning of white fat. And then that's how a lot of these supplements work through these kind of same mechanisms. Sometimes maybe increasing mitogenesis, so the more mitochondria you make, that's gonna help cause white fat to beige and then brown. Another one is turmeric or turmeric. I've heard it pronounced both ways. And it had the active ingredient in it is curcumin. And this is another one that pops up over and over and over. Uh, Turmeric's kind of nice because it's these are both anti-inflammatory. So um, whenever you have omega-6s in your phospholipids of your cell membranes, that's gonna lead to arachidonic acid, prostaglandins, inflammation. The more omega-3s you have in the phospholipids of your cell membrane, um, it's gonna, um, be anti-inflammatory. It's not going to lead down that process. Turmeric or curcumin, it's actually a COX-2 inhibitor, so it prevents um, prostaglandin production just like NSAIDs do, like Advil or something like that, or uh, Vox. And then it also has been shown to prevent Alzheimer's disease or is associated with preventing Alzheimer's disease. If you go, if you look at India where they eat a lot of Turmeric, turmeric with uh, just about every meal, they have the lowest Alzheimer's in the whole world. So um, it's, there's been studies that show it can help clear beta amyloid plaques, but it also uh, helps cause white fat to beige and brown. It increases myogenesis. It increases gene expression of uncoupling protein one. Um, another one is ginger. So a lot of people eat ginger with sushi and stuff like that. Ginger has a lot of good anti-inflammatory properties. It's good for people with GI distress, but it also um, helps with this whole browning and activation. 
situation. Um, another one, something I want to introduce to you is PPR gamma, and it stands for peroxisome proliferator activator receptor gamma. So we'll just go with PPR gamma. But um, it's a what it is is it's a nuclear receptor. So if you have a cell, let's just uh, say this is a cell here, and here's your nucleus. It's inside uh, in the cytosol. And when it gets activated by a ligand binding to its nuclear receptor, it acts like a transcription factor. It'll translocate into the DNA, and, or to the DNA, and alter gene expression. And it does a lot of positive things for gene expression. One thing it does is um, we'll kind of tie it into visceral fat. So the bad fat is visceral fat. And where you find visceral fat is or all around your intestines. So we have mesentery that's fat that connects our intestines. We also have the greater omentum, which is like a apron of fat that comes over the intestines. And the, that's where a lot of people get the, the belly is from adding to that greater omental fat. Uh, ectopic fat is bad too. That, um, it's not, it's uh, like fat that accumulates in the liver and muscle. So this is all bad fat. And visceral fat in particular sends out adipokines. So those are like chemical messengers that are attracting white blood cells, in particular macrophages. Macrophages will uh, come into the fat and reside there. And in, in obese people, about half of their adipose tissue is uh, these macrophages, and they're constantly releasing something called cytokines. And the cytokines include tumor necro necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin one and six. These are pro-inflammatory cytokines that's gonna increase inflammation in the body. And what's important about these and how this all ties in together is that these cause insulin resistance and lead you towards diabetes type two. So we all want good metabolic health and there's some things you can do to increase metabolic health, exercise, uh, browning of white fat, activating, PPR, gamma, and um, so activating PPR gamma inhibits macrophages from releasing these cytokines and preventing insulin resistance from ever taking place. And another thing that PPR gamma does uh, is it inhibits, um, so basically it goes into several places in the DNA and it will repress certain genes. So transcription factors can enhance gene expression or repress it. It's going to repress all of these. It's going to re re go to macrophages. So it will go inside the macrophage, bind to the nuclear receptor, translocate into the nucleus, and then repress gene expression of two necrosis factor alpha and interleukins one and six. And I would just remember these as your main pro-inflammatory cytokines as we get into the immune system because, um, you know, inflammation is a root cause of a lot of diseases as well. But it also goes to these proteins. There's three other proteins, but this time imagine this is a diposide or fat cell. It's gonna to bind to the nuclear receptor, the PPR receptor, uh, and then it's gonna translocate and it's gonna repress leptin, resistin, and retinol binding proteins. So resistin causes insulin resistance. So I kinda of like that name. And retinal binding protein is another one that causes insulin resistance. So if we inhibit these adipokines, adipokines are the signaling molecules that are released by adipocytes, just like cytokines are the uh, molecules released from mainly white blood cells. Something that's kind of interesting is that now they're showing that adipocytes can even add to this and release some of the tumor necrosis factor alpha and the interleukins. And so you just have all this inflammation, all these proteins that cause insulin resistance, Leptin's kind of interesting because we talked about leptin when we talked about satiety. And leptin is good because it increases metabolism and it um, increases satiety. But um, one interesting thing is when you get too much leptin, the leptin will, uh, when you get too much leptin, it's going to um, be counteractive and counterproductive. And so um, in obese people, 
they, their dipode sites are cranking out the leptin. And so when you have really, really high levels of leptin, it promotes insulin resistance. So lower levels that are natural when after a meal, uh, those are healthy and good, but higher uh, leptin, so I'll put higher leptin for this one, um, that turns in, it, it becomes bad. And so these adipokines, leptin at high level, resistant and retinol binding proteins, they all lead to what's called insulin resistance. And basically that's insulin uh, cell, like muscles, cells not responding to insulin anymore. So that's gonna keep the glucose out in the bloodstream and increase blood uh, glucose. So um, subcutaneous fat, this is a good fat. This is the fat that's under your skin, in your face, uh, legs, that kind of thing. And it's good in that it's insulin sensitive. So this subcutaneous fat does a really good job of responding to insulin and pulling glucose out of your bloodstream. And um, so you wanna eliminate visceral fat, you know, around the waist, but it's okay to have subcutaneous fat. And it's kind of interesting. There's a, there's a diabetic drug that binds to PPR gamma. It's called uh, pyoglitazone. There's also rosaglitazone. And those anti-diabetic drugs, what they do is they bind to uh, the nuclear receptor and the macrophages and the diposites, and they lead to insulin sensitivity because they're blocking everything that causes insulin resistance. But it also increases the amount of subcutaneous fat. So that's one reason why a lot of people don't like to get on the, uh, the PPR gamma agonist are because they don't like gaining weight. So average weight gain is like seven to nine pounds for people who get on this drug long term. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that fat is most likely all subcutaneous fat. So it's leading to fat that's not visceral and it's um, a good reservoir for taking glucose out of the blood. So it's really not a bad thing. We know that we talked about the GLP-1 agonist and GIP agonist that lose weight. So most people, a lot of people with type 2 diabetes also struggle with obesity. So most of them don't like the idea of gaining weight. But this, could, this, is, a, this is subcutaneous fat, which is, which is pretty good. So that's the three types of fat. We have visceral fat, which is bad. It's inflammatory. Macrophages get attracted to it, release a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, also, adipocytes are releasing all these different proteins that um, are called adipokines that cause insulin resistance. Subcutaneous fat is good because it is insulin sensitive. PPR gamma activates it. PPR gamma also causes browning of white fat. Um, so uh, that's, that's a good thing. It also activates a um, and then dipokine called adiponectin. Adiponectin increases insulin sensitivity. So all of these are bad. These all lead to insulin resistance, but PPR gamma inhibits all of this, but also activates a protein that increases insulin sensitivity called diponectin. So the whole idea as far as a diabetic drug for PPR gamma agonist is to uh, in increase insulin sensitivity. But it does tie into everything else because it, do, it is a key component of causing white fat to brown. And then the brown fat is really good because when it's activated by the sympathetic nervous system, it binds to G protein coupled receptors here, it's gonna cause um, heat to dissipate. So all these hydrogen ions that wanna get back to the matrix, instead of going through oxidative phosphorylation and making ATP, it's just leaking back into the matrix where it has to be pushed back out. So that's gonna, um, uh, that energy, that potential energy of going down its electrochemical gradient is gonna be coupled with um, metabolic heat and uh, that's gonna increase your metabolism and help pull glucose from the blood. Three, uh, three main ways to increase non-shivering thermogenesis through brown adipose tissue is cold exposure. It can either be short Really cold uh, exposures are longer, just cooler exposures. Be exercise, all different types of exercise, and supplements such as omega-3s, turmeric, ginger. Another good one is a MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides. That's another one. It actually increases, a study showed that it increases interscapular brown fat. 
and don't think it makes like a downwards hump or anything. When you have brown fat in between your shoulder blades, it's so deep and it's so small that it's not gonna be visible like um, a bad cosmetic thing, but you want as much brown fat deep in there and deep and above your uh, clavicles as possible. And it's the mitochondria that causes that beige and browning of the fat. 